People are like snowflakes. No two are alike. Our individuality will always prove this right. We move in chosen circles, feeling secure in our own space, not wanting to realize the world is a bigger place. For some, it's too unfortunate when they decide to stand alone, believing the issue won't affect them until it finally hits home. It's so easy and so simple to stay in our own town, but true success is measured in finding common ground. Hello, I'm Jim Nelson, and welcome to another edition of Common Ground. Recently in the mail, I received a book. I get a lot of books in the mail, and the authors are individuals most likely I don't know about. Well, this particular book stood out because being a history major, it was talking about some history and primarily about Native Americans or Indians or whatever the term we want to use. The book is called Touching the Fire. The author is Roger Welch. Now, for those of you who don't know who Roger Welch is, well, he has a, he's a man of many titles and many opinions. And recently talking with him, I have brought my own opinion about him. So, um, Roger Welch, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Like I said, some of us don't know who you are, but I got this bio, biography, and I have some information that perhaps you didn't know. Um, you were in the university system here in the state of Nebraska. You are from Nebraska. For a long time, I was in uh, education, taught for almost 30 years in Blair at Dana College, and then at Nebraska Wesleyan in Lincoln, and finally for almost 17 years at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Now, what did you teach? Folklore. Uh, the traditional materials, arts, culture of the ordinary people. Uh, my original degree was in languages, German uh, language and literature. A lot of fun <laughs> in German literature. <laughs> Name seven German humorists, right? Um, but it, was, it, didn't, it didn't speak to me and my German people. I, my people were German migrant laborers out in the western part of the state working in the sugar beet fields. And I knew they had music and they had poetry and my grandmother was creating quilts which were beautiful but that wasn't what we were talking about at the university until someone mentioned that magic word folklore, the culture of the ordinary people and I was okay. gone. I took that one and ran. Now were you doing that before you found out what the title was or? I guess so. I, I, you know, I was a folklorist and didn't know it but then I went off to school at Indiana, the Folklore Institute which was at that time probably the top school in folklore in America and oh. learned how to spell folklore <laughs> so I could be one. <laughs> okay, now when we talk about folklore, most people get the idea that we're talking fiction, things that, or stories, storytelling. This is something that we had no documentation that happened, but somewhere down the line, this story got passed on and on to the point where it could have been true, but it made such a great story that we continue to tell it. This is one of the things that the folklorist has to fight constantly because oral tradition is very strong. There are cultures that have persisted for a long time with nothing but oral tradition, but their stories are at least as accurate as those cultures like ours, whereas you, you know as well as I do, uh -huh. being trained in history, that history is often written by the people who won the war rather than the ones who lost. And the story, for example, just recently, the first really good book, on what happened at the Little Bighorn was, was written by a friend of mine named Joe Marshall, a first Indian view of what happened at that, that battle. And it's still in, running into a lot of resistance because people don't like that idea of listening to the people who were there or the people who heard the people who were there. They want to see the stuff in writing. But the fact of the matter is oral tradition is a very strong kind of uh, tradition in a beautiful way of finding out about our past. In this book, Touching the Fire, it's talking, you're using oral tradition to tell stories. Now the stories that you're telling are, one could actually have gone through that to the point, I mean, because there's no documentation, then you don't know if this happened or it didn't happen. But that culture says this is the way our history is told. Now tell us a little bit about the book. And what I've really tried to do here is not feed my readers a bunch of facts about any particular culture, but to use facts and history and Native American culture to tell a story which then tells us something about other cultures. Um, my argument has always been that far from stealing too much from the Native Americans, we haven't stolen nearly enough. 
took some land, <laughs> took some names like Nebraska, Kansas, Dakotas, Omaha. took some <laughs> Omaha, took some ideas like moccasins and canoes, but we left them with the really good stuff, which was their understanding of life, their understanding of their relationship with the spiritual world, with the land itself. And thank God, even after 500 years since Columbus, there are still Native Americans who cling to these powerful ideas, and some of them are still unbelievably willing to share those ideas with those of us who are not by birth Native Americans. It's a, a powerful culture, and, and they're still among us with these ideas. And I guess the book really is a plea to my non-Indian brothers and friends to start paying some attention to these people who still have a lot to teach us. How did you get connected with the Indian culture? It, it was one of those things where I just kind of trickled in. I had first met some Native Americans, some Omahas, when I was doing undergraduate work at the University of Nebraska. A professor introduced me to uh, a, a fairly young Omaha at that time, he's now gone, named Clyde Sheridan, and he was my linguistic uh, subject in a class, and I t worked on the Omaha language. And the more I met uh, with Clyde and with his family and realized that here was a part of the world I'd never seen before, I was fascinated by it. I found out there was a thing called a hand game, a kind of ritual um, music, food, dance game that they play regularly. And I, uh, Clyde asked me to go to one. I found myself in a context which, people, which my people had almost never found themselves in, or at least mm. in my generation. I was a minority for the first time in my life. No. I was, you, you believe, can you imagine that? No. <laughs> One white guy in the middle of all these Indians speaking another language, behaving in different ways, eating food I'd never eaten before. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was a revelation. You know? Okay, laugh at me. But for me, it was a revelation. Uh -huh. And I think I went through a, a progression that a lot of people do once they encounter Native American culture. First I was mildly interested and then deeply interested, then fascinated, then I go through the liberal heart bleeding stage, you know, or uh -huh, to okay. gather the canned goods and take down the boxes <laughs> of used clothing to these poor people. Then eventually I figured out there isn't really anything I can do for these people because it's the other way around. They're the ones who are rich in the ideas and the culture and what I should do is sit down, shut my mouth and listen to what they got to say. And I heard a lot over the 30 years I've known these people. Now you are, I read in some information that was sent that, now I'm, correct me if the terminology I use is wrong, um, they made you a brother or something? No, no. A man named Buddy Gilpin, who passed away uh, just about a year ago, adopted me as a brother in 1967, which I thought was one of these things, you know, like they do with the politicians, you know, put a headdress on him, give him a name, funny name, you know, uh -huh. like he who talks with great wind and, <laughs> and then send him back to Omaha or Washington or wherever they're going. But it turned out that it was much more to Buddy than, than that. He had actually adopted me as a brother and to his mind and then, of course, certainly to mine, I had become actually a part of his life and of the Omaha tribe. And I've tried to honor that enormous uh, gesture that he made by respecting those things that he taught me. Okay. Let's talk a little about the culture itself and see if we can shed some light onto those who aren't aware. You mentioned a lot about the, the spiritual sense and this, you know, the American side, society has a great tradition of the separation of the church and state. Uh, how does it work to the advantage, how could it work to the advantage when uh, the American society starts adapting the values of the Indian culture? It's really embarrassing to move in and out of Omaha culture and into mainstream American culture these days. Okay. Because on one hand, one hears on television a major political candidate whose name will remain unmentioned who says, yeah, 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 and you didn't put God in your platform, you know, oh, wow, is that painful. <laughs> then you move among the Omahas who are trying to live a life which is a prayer of gratitude. Their entire life is meant to be a prayer of gratitude. And they, they fail just like all of us do because we're all human beings. Right. But they are actually trying to live a spiritual life in which their religion is a part of their lives all the time. Not that they're trying to shove it down somebody mm -hmm. else's throat and say, 30 seconds today, you've got to pray my prayer. Nothing like that. It's just that they try to take care of their own affairs without saying anything to you about what yours should be. 
really tough to see that in action up at Macy and then come back and watch your television set and seeing people <laughs> snarling at each other, which also was one of the most profound arguments I've ever heard. Um, the Omahas, uh, this would have been, oh, 25 years ago, were given a dance along with all of the rituals that go with it called the Tayapia Society, the Warrior Society, from the Kiowas. And I sat in a gathering of Omahas one night in Lincoln as they discussed this cultural gift. And I was shocked at these people talking, relatively uneducated laborers, poor folks, but talking in, with philosophical fervor about something like I'd never heard talked about among the faculty at the University of Nebraska. Can we accept a, something like a dance from the Kiowa in which there are hereditary positions, they asked. Because then we're committing our unborn great, 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 great grandchildren to something that we are taking the decision. Can we do that? Wow, I'd never heard any non-Indians talking with that kind of seriousness about cultural exchange. But the most, and it was not only the content, it was also the format of their discussion that night. One person would say something like that. Can we mm -hmm. accept a gift for our great, 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 great grandchildren? Then there would be this 15 minute pause while everybody sat and thought about what that person has said. Now, imagine coming out of that kind of context into a political context where people are yelling at mm -hmm. each other's faces, never listening to what the other person says. So sometimes even just little things like this that I watched the Omahas and I thought, God, I wish my culture had the sense to learn a little bit of this. There ought to be something in Congress, on Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> on count, point counterpoint, that after one person finishes talking, you have to sit there for five minutes with your mouth quiet while you think about what it is that the other person said. Well, maybe we think too much. <laughs> maybe that's it. <laughs> you know, it's like we think we have to respond because they said something, as opposed to just wondering and understanding what was said. Well, I'm sure there'd be some unhappiness on television and certainly radio if you had 15-minute dead spots yeah. while people sat around and thought. You could be running a spot there, you know, we could be making some money or something. What has this done for you as far as having this association? Well, it's changed my life because I'm sure I would have been 100% mainstream, uptight German, uh, rather than having at least these little doses of Native American culture that they've shared with me and that I've managed to think about and incorporate into my own life. Among the Omahas, for example, it, they laugh about it, but it's also true that, I guess, truth, true things we can laugh at too, huh? Uh, that there, there's Indian time and white man time, and they, they use those terms specifically. I don't wear a watch because I do what I can to pay my respect, respects to Indian time. And if there's a meeting tomorrow, they'll say, uh, two o'clock, is that Indian time or white man time? Well, if it's white man time, that means you're uptight all the time. It's gonna tell you when you're hungry, when you're ready to go to sleep, well, time to make love, you know, and, and so forth and so on. Whereas among Native American culture, they realize that time is a tool, that, like a, a hammer that we invented at one point that we can use or not use. And it's become our governor, and it's no longer a mm -hmm. tool, it's our god. And we lit among the Lakota sometimes, um, at some occasions, there'll be a clown dancer at a, a powwow or a sun dance. And the clown dancer does everything wrong. You're supposed to go one direction around the drum, he goes the wrong way around the drum. And you're supposed to end on the last beat of the music. He'll go on another 10 steps, right? Uh -huh. The clown dancer very often is wearing a suit and a tie and has a white flower sack <laughs> pulled over his head with red lips and blue eyes painted on there. Of course, because the guy who does everything wrong is the white guy, right? <laughs> and very often, he'll dance with an alarm clock in his hand because it tells him everything, when to start dancing, when to stop dancing. So it's really pretty amusing to see how other cultures look at the culture that I'm in, to be able to step over onto that island, look back and say, wait a minute, you know, we aren't doing things because they're logical or because they're reasonable, but because that's the way we do it. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's worth taking another thought about it. Maybe some days in our lives, we don't have to wear that watch. Speaking of um, white man time, you, before you wrote this book, you were writing books about living in uh, small towns in Nebraska and the people there. Let's take a little time and talk about that. My last book was called It's Not the End of the Earth, but you can see it from here. And it was about life in a small Nebraska town. But there were several chapters in there where I also dealt 
with Native American uh, culture, with the problems of being a Native American within small town culture and small town attitudes toward blacks because racism is pervasive, I think, in small towns in Nebraska too. Um, it was the chapters, the publisher said, Random House, on Native American culture that captured the most interest and attention, and that led then oh. to this book. They said, why not just do one that deals specifically with Native American culture, and that's what led to this. I'm not sure that life in a small town is necessarily very awfully far from dealing with Native American culture, um, because I'm an outsider also to small town life. I lived in Lincoln all of my life and moved to the little town and was fascinated by life in small towns, which is quite different from the way I grew up again. And the people in the small towns very often think I'm a little wacky, thinking it's so great out there. <laughs> um, but I, as an outsider, had a chance to see things going on in a small town that people who grew up there and lived with it all their lives might even have been annoyed by that everybody knows your business. In some cases, uh -huh. that's kind of nice to have everybody know your business because it's like a security system, right. too, that you know, you're a lot safer in a family than you are out by yourself. Well, that's, I think, what happened with the Native American culture, too. It seems to me it'd be logical to ask uh, another white guy writing about Indian culture. Haven't we had just about enough of that? Well, I think that I can see things from outside Native American culture that those who grew up within it may not be able to see. We also need books from Native Americans about Native right. American culture. And we're getting some good ones from Scott Mamaday, from Joe Marshall, from William Least Heat Moon. And what we really need, too, I think uh, quicker the better, are some books about non-Indian culture from Native Americans, oh, letting let, them have a chance at, to right, look at what's right. going on in mainstream culture and commenting on why it, what, what they see as being the peculiarities, what's funny about what mainstream culture is up to. Now, since you've been writing, you've had the chance to do a lot of traveling as well, I assume. Yeah. I, well, I, when I say travel, I'd I mean rather Nebraska, the East Coast, the West Coast, the Midwest, those particular areas. Each of those areas has been typically stereotyped as far as the kind of people there. What have you found to be the case with each of the areas? How do uh, Easterners look at Midwesterners, and how do um, Westerners look at Midwesterners? Well, I could have written that question myself. I think that's <laughs> terrific. I would have asked me that question if I had my choice. I, I think it's an interesting change taking place. There was a, a time when both coasts could look at uh, us sitting out here, and if you were making a movie or writing a play, and you wanted to have somebody who was really a know-nothing bozo, somebody who was a real hillbilly, nice guy, but kind of stupid, all you had to do was say, this girl is from Omaha. You got it. <laughs> this guy's from Iowa, and everybody knows what he is, right? He's a good-hearted lug that really doesn't know very much about the way things really are. I think that's changing, and it's changing in very positive ways. People are starting to really be interested, I think, in what life is like out here. The convention list today right. in, in Omaha is jammed. There isn't room right. in a hotel. What's happening, I don't know whether it was Ian Fraser's book, The Great, Great uh, Plains, whether it's people like uh, Garrison Keillor mm -hmm. writing about right. life humorously in a small town, whether it's the kind of television shows, that, but something is happening. And the people who used to think of themselves as being the very top of the cultural pile are starting to look at what life is like in a city like Omaha where you have a top-notch sym symphony mm -hmm. and yet you still can go out in the countryside and, and fish in the rivers and, and walk around and meet some guy out in the countryside too with, without the kinds of problems that you might have in the big cities. Right. And I think we're, we are at the edge, I honestly believe this, of becoming uh, an area of envy where people are going to look and say, God, I wish our sky were like that. I wish that we had that kind of sunsets. I wish, and the letters that I'm getting from Sunday morning, uh, my work with, with CBS is, is really aiming in that direction increasingly. And I think Charles Kuralt, as a country boy himself, sees this because Sunday morning is really kind of an elitist show. There aren't very many other places on commercial network television where you've got a jazz segment by I Billy know, Taylor. I know, I you've know. Got, you've got a book review uh -huh. on national television by John Leonard. 
uh, Eugenia Zuckerman with music, all kinds of things that really appeal to elitist culture. And six minutes every other week with this fat guy in overalls <laughs> from Nebraska, right? <laughs> Talking about the last three pieces we did this past weekend are a wedding on the Main Street in Dannenbrog where they just closed off the Main Street for a dance. You don't do that in Omaha very often, I don't suppose. But it happens in Dan and Main Street now. <laughs> we covered a football game at Elba High School where there's only 19 boys in the school. So they have six man football, a team of six guys. And the, when a play starts, everybody's an eligible receiver. I mean, it, <laughs> the center is an eligible receiver. It's a wide open game. So I get a chance every other week to tell people back east, while they're bringing the opera and the theater and books and literature and art to Dan Abrog from the east and west coasts. I get that pop at taking the kind of culture that we have out here on the plains back to the big cities too. And I think that's part of that whole thing, that people are increasingly fascinated by what life is like in a small town, what life is like in Omaha and Lincoln, mm -hmm. and what, what we do out here. Now see, the people here though, we take it for granted. Or are or, or even embarrassed, I think, very often mm -hmm. by what life is like here. You almost say, where are you from? <laughs> Omaha, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Danabra, Grand Island, you know. And we're, we, but, but it's not bad. They'll say, it's not bad. Life's not bad. We have a symphony. I don't think we need to apologize anymore. I think increasingly people, if we, if we just hesitate after we say, I'm from Omaha, I'm from Grand Island, they'll ask us the next question about, is it really as nice out there as the fat guy in overalls tells us it is on Sunday morning. <laughs> wow. Uh, there's, there's so much. There's just so much. We're talking about Roger Welch's new book, Touching the Fire, and we're also talking about Roger Welch. And first of all, we want you, you got to get the book. You know, I think we got a shot of the book. We want to show you. You need to get this book. Um, you were saying that this is the first for you in writing some serious information. I, yeah, I, I say that, but I don't want it to sound like a bunch of sermonettes. You know, it's no. not Roger Welch's collection of sermonettes. <laughs> I, I hope there's some laughs in here and some drama. Oh, yeah. too, but the fact of the matter is, this is the, the most serious uh, theme I've ever taken up, because I think it is a serious theme, and that's the importance of Native American culture, the importance of remembering that it's not dead and we shouldn't kill it, because there's a lot of that pressure going on, too. Uh, but the, and, it, and it's not a do-gooder book. I'm not trying yeah. to say, gosh, look at the poor Indians. Let's take care of them and give them some more used clothes. I'm saying th these are uh, serious issues that we need to think about and that we can use in our lives, too. Uh, those of us who are not Native Americans can certainly profit from uh, the kinds of things that they can still teach us. The situation in the East and West Coast, um, are there a lot of Native Americans there? There are. Uh, the East Coast, probably the fewest number because they've been the longest under assault, 500 years of cultural uh, assault uh, okay. back there. Probably on the plains, we have people who are most close to their backgrounds, the Lakota and the Omaha. The Omaha are living where they've always lived, or at least where they've lived for 300 years. Uh, they're still on their native land, which is unusual because the Pawnee, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, Arapaho, the Ponca, the Odo were all removed from Nebraska. And the Omaha, amazingly, are still on their land, partially because they were just quiet farmers. They never fought a battle with the invaders. They simply continued to farm their fields and try to live a peaceful life and so survived up here in the hills north of Omaha. Um, but uh, there, there are there are Indian peoples, Native American peoples. What's the terminology? Well, what what I, term? Because we, you know, we, we're good for I, labels. I, I had an argument with Joe Marshall, as a matter of fact, the fellow who wrote Soldiers Falling Into Camp about this, because he was offended by the use of Indians. After all, it was Columbus's stupidity that he thought, <laughs> well, maybe not stupidity, because well, he just didn't know, right? <laughs> he thought he was in India. OK, it's uh -huh. a small mistake to make. <laughs> uh, but I said, I, I, think it's, I, think it's a, I think it's a good term because it keeps reminding us of the mistakes we've made in the past. I think it's great to have this word Indian so we can keep saying, of course, they're not really Indians because they're not from India because mm -hmm. all of this mistake was made and is still persisting after all this time. So I kind of like it as a reminder of, of how misunderstood these people have been. It's a nice term for the, But uh, then you talk about history, too, that people need to follow through and understand. Right. And, and uh, you can argue, well, they're no more Native Americans than we are. The Germans came later, certainly, than the Omaha, but the Native Americans came across the Bering Straits. But there's a lot of Native Americans who say, oh, no, 
They'll say, see that rock right over there? That's where our people came up from the, the netherworld through there. That rock was rolled in there to keep the monsters down below the earth. We've always been here. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. so you got to be a little careful, too, about talking about migrations, because that may be one theory, but there's another theory, too, among many peoples. What's going to happen after this? In terms of my, my work, yeah. you're thinking? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm ready to go. I've always had another book in the works. And I'd like to do another one. Uh, there, there were enough ideas uh, that I never even managed to touch with this book uh, that I'd like to get another shot at it. I'd like to keep writing and, and work some more with Native American materials because I think it's such fascinating stuff and such worthwhile material. People are watching and they're saying, as we said at the beginning, you were in education and you left and you started writing. People said, well, I got all these stories uh, or I, I'm just as capable as Roger Welch to do this. What was the key that got you over that hump to say, I'm doing this? It's easy. I can tell you exactly. It was stupidity because I didn't know that I couldn't write a book. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to be able to write a book, so I did it, and I took it down to the University of Nebraska Press, my first one in 1963. I wrote it, and they looked at it, and they said, we've been looking for something just like this. Sure, we'll accept this book. And I thought, well, that was easy enough. I guess that's the way it always goes, huh? <laughs> you know? So. Uh, I said before that I think it's important that uh, Native Americans take a look at mainstream white culture. Each one of us has a perspective. A, a Native American woman has a view which is different from a Native American man, so there should be more Native American women. Right? A Native American woman who is uh, 80 years old has a different, she should be right. A Native American woman who's 80 years old who lived on the reservation then moved, has, every one of us has a perspective that is worth exploring. And uh, the most, when people write to me and say, how should I start writing, and would you take a look at what I do? I say, absolutely not, I wouldn't take a look at it, because that's playing games. Mm -hmm. Write your stuff and send it where it counts. Send it to where it can be printed. Uh, send it to a magazine, send it to a newspaper, send it to a publisher. Uh, learn how to take uh, rejection slips in good spirit and remember that editors not only don't know everything, they hardly know anything. <laughs> uh, and you've got to have some confidence in yourself. Write those things down and get them going. We got one minute left. Um, what would you say about this book? It would be your biggest lesson that you've learned, or I don't say lesson, but enjoyment that you got from writing this book. Uh, it was kind of scary writing this book because everything else, every time, every time I've written another book, I had a whole bunch of notes and I worked from the notes and an outline and I wrote a rough draft and I did the kinds of things you're supposed to do. This time, the words appeared on my computer screen and I read the book as it appeared before me, no kidding, and I'd come home every night excited to be able to tell my wife what it was that happened that day with the characters we came to love. Ooh. The book is called Touching the Fire, Roger Welch, this is number 16? 16. Go out and get it. Thank you very much, well, thank Roger. Thank you very much. That's it for this edition of Common Ground. I'll see you next time.